At the tail end of episode 11, I mentioned I was headed towards the forum shops to pick up dinner and to continue my session into the night over at Caesar's Palace. That happened, but this episode skips over that timeline and instead happens a few days later. No worries though, we'll write the ship at some point in the near future. We arrive at the Caesar's book room in the early AM hours of the night and immediately get sat down at a six-handed 2-5 game in progress near the back corner of the room. We buy in for the table maximum of 500 and immediately start picking up several strong hands with good playability before we get a chance to set up the camera. It seems like there's a fair share of action at this table and we're looking eagerly to get into the mix. This first hand starts about an orbit in, where our early position player limps for 5, and when we peek down at 9 native clubs in the hijack, we raise to 30, and action folds all the way back to the limper, who calls without any additional contemplation. We see ace-queen 4 rainbow on the flop, and when checked to, we have a natural bet of 35 here, and end up getting a quick call from our opponent. The 6 of clubs on the turn adds some additional equity to the hand, and when the opponent checks, it feels pretty weak. At this point, we're assigning our opponent with a one pair type of hand. We have two options here. One is to check back and realize our equity, and the second one is to continue telling our story of being strong with our perceived range advantage. We choose the latter and bet $90, and our opponent calls pretty quickly again in a manner which tells us that he's just not that strong. The deuce on the river is an effective brick. When the opponent does the two chip check, his hand is relatively face up, and I'm at the near bottom of my range. At this point, we've already arrived at the decision not to play our literal hand value, but rather play against our opponent. We unload the clip and shove all in for 325, which is roughly a pot sized bet. This places max pressure on our opponent, and when he asks the dealer how much for a count, we're now on the fence on how this hand is going to end. After another 15 seconds, our opponent decides on a Pulled. Definitely not an optimal play, but we pulled the trigger and got the job done. A quick shout out to all the subscribers of this channel. For those who haven't done so already, consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel so you don't miss out on any future content. This next hand that we'll be covering happens to be the very next hand while we're still stacking chips. We look down at our hand and find two aces and raise to 25 without missing a beat. The action folds around to the big blind who decides that 25 is not enough and opts to raise it to 105. At this point, I think any action besides folding probably looks really strong. So after we get a quick estimate on how much this opponent's playing, we decide to jam all in. Our opponent doesn't think for long before calling it off. The board runs out 5 high, which is really favorable for aces all things considering. And the opponent just mucks his hand before the river is even dealt. So I believe this player likely had 2 Broadway cars here, which was just unlucky on his part. This next hand feels like deja vu, mainly because it is. The bun straddles on and we have a min raise to 20 in early position by the same opponent from the previous hand. We look down at the very same pocket aces down to the specific suits and raise to 85. At this point the table has filled up and the table dynamics have shifted a bit. Action falls to the button who asks whether or not this is going to make the vlog if he calls. Sort of a funny comment to make and even a sicker one had he called. But then the action folds to the original Razor, who thinks better of it this time and folds as well. We're developing some dynamics with some of the opponents at the table. What's interesting is some of them know that I'm a vlogger as well, much like the big blind in this next hand. This can be problematic as it tends to skew action for a myriad of reasons. Nevertheless, I've been adjusting my game to counter, but it's definitely not the A game I enjoy playing as it becomes a leveling war. Most of the time, it's a leveling war with myself. Here, we pick up queen 9 in the cutoff, and there's merits to folding this on some tables, but not this one. I raise to 20, and the big blind defends. The flop comes 10 7 5 monotone. The big blind checks, and I continue for 30, and the big blind calls. The turn brings a 9, which makes the board even more dynamic. The big blind checks, and we check behind as well. When the river is a 6, the big blind checks again. And the hands that this opponent arrives to the river with comprises mostly of either a busted heart draw or two pair. Given our line in this hand, it makes little sense to bet here. We check behind and take our pair of nines to show down, and the big line shows 9-7 for two pair to win the pot. In this next hand, 
We find ourselves with King Jack off in a low drag and raise the 25 after one limper. Action folds to the small blind who calls the raise while the original limper folds. Head up, we go to a flop of Jack 8 5 with two hearts. When checked to me, I toss in a standard C bet of 30 and the small blind calls. The turn is a 10, and when action is checked to us, we check behind to give a little rope to this specific opponent. The river is a 6, and the opponent now leads for 75. This is somewhat of a peculiar bet. This opponent has been caught bluffing several times over so far, and given the action and distribution of hands here, I think there's not a whole lot to do but to make a fairly straightforward call. The opponent flips over a 6-4 of clubs for a missed gutter on the flop, and we scoop this one in. We are definitely picking up some premium holdings in this game. In the immediate hand following, we find ourselves in a three-way all-in with pocket queens. Pre-flop, there's an early position limper, and when I raise the 25 in mid-position, one of the late position players shoves all-in for 112. At the time, I thought it was a little unusual to see the limper call the all-in given he was so short with roughly 70 behind. But that makes my decision to rejam that much easier. The limper calls the rest of his stack off and we're off to see the flop. Three ways, we see all five cards, which runs out with four spades. We don't hold a spade and lose the main pot to pocket tens, but we do end up picking up the side pot with a set against ace high. Little would I know that this hand would mark the start of his turning point within the session. We began hemorrhaging chips for the next hour or so and we'll be covering some of the swing and misses as they help paint the full picture of volatility within a given session. In this next hand, the straddle's on and we find a suited ace-10 in the hijack and this is good enough to raise to 40 after one limper. We end up getting calls from the big blind, straddle, and mid-position limper. The flop comes king-7-4 rainbow. There might be merits to betting this flop heads up, but four ways might be a little too spewy. The action checks around. The turn is a six of clubs and now the mid-position limper bets out 90 and we fold our hand. There were many other hands that just never connected on multi-way action. Quite a few of them, in fact. The next hand of interest we pick up is pocket sevens in the hijack. There's a mid-position limp. I limp along as well, and the cutoff raises to 25, where he gets no less than four callers. We're five ways to the flop of five, six, seven with two clubs, which is one of those really connected boards. Relatively speaking, we have a pretty good hand, but it's fairly vulnerable to all kinds of draws, including flushes and straights. The action ends up checking to the cutoff, who now bets 75, and when action folds all the way back to me, we're piling as much as we can in right now, as we're very much likely ahead of the draws that this particular opponent has. Once I raise this to 225, the opponent immediately shoves all in for 425, and we're officially off to the races. Luck, as you would have it, isn't on our side this time as the 8 of clubs and the 9 of spades roll off on the turn and river. Our opponent shows the jack 7 of clubs for the jack high flush and we lose a sizable pot here. Not long after, we get dealt pocket queens and raised to 35 in the small blind after a limp in late position. Not too surprisingly, we get a call from this opponent. Heads up, we go to the flop of jack 3 deuce and we fire a continuation bet of 35. After some deliberation, the opponent calls. The turn is a queen, which on the surface might look like a great card now that we have top set, but it's not that great as an overcard to the jacks. I decide to play this as a two straight hand, and action checks around. The river is an ace, and when I check here, the opponent bets 125, which is nearly a pot size bet. I end up shoving for 420, which in hindsight is an obvious mistake, and I get slow rolled by 4-5. As pointless and idiotic as I think slow rolling people is, I guess there's always that one person at the table who thinks it might be something cool to do. We reload for 500 and a little bit later we find ourselves playing six handed with a suited queen in mid position. The button straddles on and we limp in and so does the cutoff. Action's on the slow roller and he raises it to 45 in the small blind. We call along with the cutoff and the button. At this point the cutoff loudly says Bingo me. You know you're definitely in a good game when you hear that. We're four ways to the flop of 10, 4, 6 with two hearts. As the flop appears, the cutoff whispers, that's good enough for me. 
The small blind sea bets this flop were 55, and I call here considering that the cutoff is playing about 150 and is likely to shove all in. Sure enough, the cutoff follows through and shoves all in. The small blind now tank calls and this is an easy rejam here for roughly 600. Highly annoyed, the small blind eventually folds. The turn and river come a jack of spades followed by an ace of hearts. We show our queen high flush and the opponent shows 10-7 off. At this point of the night, the game drops down to three-handed with no sign of stopping. We ramp up the aggression and seem to get looked up every time we have it and occasionally get an interesting bluff through undetected. We have a manual to my direct left on the button who knows about the vlog and definitely knows how to keep the game going. We've been trading blows back and forth for most of the night and it's about to get somewhat interesting for the next few hands. We look down at pocket kings when the button raises to 20. When the small blind calls, the price of the mission is getting kicked up to 75. This doesn't deter either opponent as they both call. We're three ways to a flop of 773. The small blind checks and we continue here for 75. This is a nominal bet to thin the field a little. The button gets out of the way and the small blind calls. The turn is another 7 and the action checks around. When the river is a deuce and the small blind checks here, I bet out 100 to target pocket pairs and possibly a 3, but we don't get any further value for the hand. We scoop in a decent pot and move on to the next. The following we'll be reviewing from my notes as it was a pretty interesting hand. This might be borderline insane and probably ill-advised. We're playing four-handed and the general game has been getting a little aggressive recently. This is good in the sense that there's a lot of trading and volatility. Both the cutoff and button limp in and we look down at ace jack off suit and complete for five. The big blind, our friendly opponent Emmanuel, raises it to 25 and both cutoff and button call the raise. With the raise in two calls, there's a lot of dead money out there and ace jack has some good removal to some of the stronger hands available. We also have a fairly solid image at the table showing down some credible hands time to time along with some atypical lines. We squeeze here to 150 and get this heads up once the big blind calls. The flop of king 10-7 with two diamonds is fairly dynamic. We fire out a continuation bet of 160 which is pretty standard here given the circumstances. The big blind pretty quickly calls. The turn brings the five of clubs which is a brick. We go ahead and fire 360, which leaves us roughly with a half pot size bet on the river. The big blind calls again, which narrows down his range considerably. The river is a deuce of hearts. All the draws brick out. While we have the jack of diamonds, it's not a great card to have if we're going to pull the trigger. But at least it's not the ace of diamonds. After some contemplation, we decide to jam it in here for 704. We're looking to put max pressure on the majority of the opponent's value holdings, including king-queen and possibly king-jack. Ace-king with the ace of diamonds would also have somewhat of a difficult decision here, given the table dynamics and the fact that he hasn't seen me pull off any zero equity plus from earlier. So as far as he's concerned, I should have a relatively strong range here. He needs to be right here more than 50% of the time to make this a profitable call which is really the interesting dilemma here at nearly 300 big blinds deep. Our opponent ends up folding here, and while we never see his hand, he looks pretty distraught after the fold and announces he had folded ace-king, which could very well be the case. So, we clock in another win at Vegas 2-5, which is definitely a good feeling. We were in for 1,000 and out for 2319, for a win of roughly 1,300 over 6 hours. Let's aim to keep the run good going. In the next episode, I think we'll be headed back over to the Bellagio to battle it out in the 510 game, so stay tuned for that. Always a fun time at the tables, so long as you don't take yourself too seriously. As always, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and see you next time.